SCP Containment Breach. It's a hallmark of indie horror and it's one of my favorite games of all time. So I figured I'd pair one of my favorite games of all time with one of YouTube's favorite video formats. And one of mine too, these iceberg videos are really fun. That's right, it's time for the SCP Containment Breach Iceberg. Now I actually made this chart myself. I hope you like those little gradient images, I think they're pretty fun. Uh, but I made it myself because a lot of times you'll see the creators of these iceberg videos use icebergs they did not make, and then they'll get confused as to what certain entries mean. So to avoid any confusion, I just made it myself. Now to clear up any other confusion, I'm going to be talking specifically about the original 2012 version of the game. I will be talking about remakes and stuff like that, but they will all be how it relates back to the original game or how they were inspired by the original game. And with all that out of the way, we have a lot to go over today, so let's just get into it. D9341 is the designation given to the character you play as in SCP Containment Breach, and he's one of the more interesting parts of the game's lore. You play as a Class D personnel, and for those of you who don't know what that means, uh, Class D are essentially test subjects, prisoners, usually people convicted of horrible crimes who are sent to die and testing for the cause of researching the effects of SCPs. The leaflet at the start of the game that gives the main character this name it says that you will be pardoned for your crimes at the end of your sentence, but we all know that's not true. There's actually a lot to cover when it comes to D9341, so we'll be discussing him multiple times throughout this video. All you need to know for now though is that he is a Class D personnel who manages to escape the facility during a containment breach, which is quite a feat. Some doors in the game require a keycard to open. As you go through the game, these keycard requirements will get higher and higher. There are five levels of keycards, going from a level 1 keycard to a level 5. Well, actually, there's technically one more. The keycard Omni, which opens every keycard door in the game and is a step above level 5. You even get an achievement for getting it. The thing is, you don't need a keycard Omni. As far as I can tell, there's no keycard door in the game that the level 5 doesn't open. So the question is, what's the point of the Omni? Well, like I said, gameplay wise, it's the exact same as a level 5 keycard. But you can't just find the Omni laying around anywhere. The only way to obtain it is with SCP-914. Lore-wise, though, this is probably the keycard that would be used by very high-ranking Foundation members, such as O5 members. In fact, in SCP Secret Lab, a game heavily inspired by SCP Containment Breach, the equivalent card in that game is just called an O5 card. So. I think we can extrapolate here that the keycard Omni is used by very few high-ranking members, and that's why it's so prestigious in the game. Okay, this one is actually one of the more popular misconceptions about the game. You see, Site-19 in the SCP lore is one of the largest SCP facilities, hosting many dangerous SCPs. It was most famously mentioned in SCP-173's document, which is, of course, the document that started it all. Now, this would imply that SCP Containment Breach takes place at Site-19, since 173 is there. However, it's actually never explicitly stated to be Site-19 in the game. In fact, the part about SCP-173 being at Site-19 is not included in its in-game document. So, by all measures, we actually have no idea what site the game takes place in. It's just a very popular misconception that it takes place at Site-19, again, because of 173's document. 
SCP Containment Breach Unity Edition is a now cancelled project whose original goal was to remake SCP Containment Breach and the Unity engine, but later on sought to forge its own identity. A lot of people who played or watched the final versions of the game might not know this, but the first few versions of the game were pretty much direct remakes of the original, with less features but better graphics. As time went on though, the developers wanted to create something more original, and wanted to even completely phase out all assets from the original. And they were doing a pretty good job at that. The game has a completely different vibe. The models were really good, as well as the sound effects and the visual effects, everything was really well polished. Gameplay wise though, it was okay. I mean, it was an alpha build, but still, it didn't really have a goal for you to achieve, other than just exploring. It also felt a bit less scary than the original. Like, I felt like I was being chased a lot less often, and when I was being chased, it was pretty easy to get away. I mean, even in the latest version of the game, it still just kind of feels like a demo. And in reality, that's kind of what it is. I mean, people were really excited to see where the developers were going to take this project, including me. I mean, finally, there was a popular SCP game that had a unique feel to it, because a lot of games just copied the original SCP Containment Reach, including the look of the rooms, the look of the SCPs, everything. And despite the fact that this had the name SCP Containment Breach Unity Edition, it actually had a unique feel to it, which was a pretty unique concept at the time. Unfortunately for fans of this game, it, the project was cancelled in January 2021 due to health complications with the head developer of the game. And this was a very sad day for the SCP game community. I heard that the other developers of this game might be working on something, but... I couldn't find any updates on that, so I wouldn't count on that. On the topic of games based on the original, we actually have a republishing of the original, but with multiplayer features implemented. This version is actually on Steam, and it's the same engine with the same mechanics, and it works almost exactly the same as the original. It should be noted that this version has nothing to do with the original creator. It was actually created by a team of modders. In fact, this this whole game actually started out as a mod, and then it came to be published on Steam. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You can play SCP Containment Breach with your friends. In addition to the normal survival mode, there are also other game modes, such as playing as SCPs or Nine-Tailed Fox. However, you could literally just play the original on your own if you wanted to, and you'd get basically the exact same experience as if you downloaded the normal version of the game. In fact, I'd say this is probably the, the best way to play SCP Containment Breach, because you can just download it on Steam, and it actually runs slightly better than the original, and is more stable in general, so... <laughs> SCP-087-B is essentially the predecessor to SCP Containment Breach. It was made by the same developer, in the same engine, and even features some of the same assets. It features kind of similar gameplay. I mean, you're walking through a series of randomly generated hallways and staircases with a spooky monster lurking in the darkness. It also features several random events that can occur. The goal is to get as far as you can into the depths without dying. And it sounds relatively simple, but it's actually pretty scary, especially with how dark and claustrophobic the hallways are and the constantly droning music. You can see how this would be the precursor to SCP Containment Breach. This game became very popular through Let's Plays, giving the game a popularity that helped SCP Containment Breach get a running start in terms of its popularity. And, uh, speaking of Let's Plays... This entry references the fact that SCP Containment Breach has been quite a popular thing to cover on YouTube, despite the game itself being somewhat niche. There's no doubt that a large portion of this game's popularity comes from the YouTube content that was made from it from bigger YouTubers doing playthroughs like PewDiePie No, not you! Close the door! Stop! Close! So sorry, bro! Alright, guys, <laughs> And Markiplier Bing bong! Every other SCP out dungeons kill me! What can you do? Bing bong! 
Bring on, bring it on! Okay. To YouTubers that specifically focused on making content for this game, like the Batesy. Oh no, I can hear it. Oh no! <laughs> Gel Legends. All right, now that we found the cafeteria, we can go ahead and find SCP-294. Joining me here today is my good pal, 106. How's it going, man? Oh! Neferon. You want to flip this first switch up, which will lower this box to the floor. Then you want to turn the sound transmission on. And then you want to break a dude's leg. Battleforge. Hey, and it works. Ah, shit! Okay, maybe it doesn't work as well as I thought. Kind of, that's like, kind of what you get for being a little bit cocky. And even the talented Glenn Leroy. SCP, SCP, SCP-173, SCP, SCP, SCP-173. When I first saw him, I was really scared. We came with three men and got fully prepared. Standing in the corner, there against the wall. Looking like a giant white concrete rubber doll. This game has had, and in many ways still does have, a very big presence on YouTube and online content in general. Now, this is true of a lot of indie games, especially indie horror games, that they become popular mainly due to YouTube. However, this game is special in that it's regarded among the hallmarks of indie horror games that were popular on YouTube, such as Amnesia and Slender. Now, I am not saying that it owes all its popularity to YouTube content. In fact, a lot of people who played it were just people who were clamoring for a good SCP horror game. It was really the first of its kind in terms of SCP games, and there was a reason it was copied so much. But it would be disingenuous to act like a big part of the game's fanbase didn't come from people watching content about it. In fact, I probably wouldn't be so into SCP if it weren't for the YouTube content specifically about this game. So these kinds of Let's Plays and other kinds of YouTube content really have a special place in my heart. The Femur Breaker is a machine used to lure in SCP-106 if he needs to be recaptured. The lore behind it is that SCP-106 is such a, a sicko that he's drawn in by the helpless victim. In this case, a man who's just had his femur crushed by this machine. But the mere concept of the machine itself is not the only thing iconic about it, but also the sounds associated with it. Just the, the sound of the machine paired with the gruesome screaming of the victim became so iconic. It's inspired many, many memes and even remixes. Even I've made a remix of it on my own music channel. <laughs> Shameless plug. It became an especially viral meme in the 2019 and 2020 era, even becoming more popular than the game itself for a time, with many of our favorite characters experiencing the joys and wonders of the Femur Breaker. Memory Access Violation If you've ever played SCP Containment Breach, especially some of the older versions, and especially more if you've ever tried to mod it, then you've probably seen this phrase before. Memory Access Violation is an error handling message that appears in a little window of its own when the game crashes. This became so frequent that it actually became a meme within the community. There's even an in-game message that references this. If you continually press the elevator button while the elevator is still coming, the game will get angrier and angrier at you, eventually saying that it will generate a memory access violation if you don't stop, which is pretty funny. It doesn't, or at least it shouldn't, although I wouldn't be surprised if it did by accident, sometimes. Playing throughout the game, you may have heard a little musical sound or seen a duck with a saxophone. 
It's an oddly whimsical detour from the tone of the rest of the game, and it's based on this joke SCP article, which describes many anomalous ducks with different qualities. We could even find the description for the one that appears in SCP Containment Breach. Object appears to be a duck holding a small saxophone, which it has been observed to play at random intervals, emitting a single drawn out note, followed by a series of melodically unrelated notes. In game, in addition to the music, they will disappear if you blink or look away from them, and appear in various spots throughout the facility. It's one of the few joke in SCPs included, along with SCP-420J and the Butt Ghost, which I'm not going to even get into. But honestly, it wouldn't be SCP without the joke SCPs, so it wouldn't be a proper SCP game without a few joke SCPs thrown in. You may have noticed that a lot of the voices in the game sound pretty similar, if not the exact same, and while the game features several voice actors, most of the voices you hear in the game are done by one of two people. The first one being It's Duke, who voices many of the human characters in the game, including but not limited to multiple MTF units, guards, this specific janitor, What the hell? Oh, it's just a and every single character at Gate A and Gate B, as well as the ending voices. And yes, this includes the Chaos Insurgency, which always confused me when I was younger, because the Chaos Insurgency sounds the exact same as the guards in the MTF, which made me think that they were MTF, and this ending made absolutely no sense. The other voice actor goes by the name The Volgun, who is most famous for doing SCP-049's voice, but he also does SCP-035's voice, SCP-990's voice, as well as any voice you hear coming from the player character, D9341, and the entire PA system. Attention. There's actually a funny series uh, on the Volgun's channel where he does, uh, he plays through games as SCP-049, like, for example, this video, we have SCP-049 playing Plague Inc., which is hilariously ironic. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Let's Play of Plague Inc. Today, we are going to be doing the Necroa virus. As you can see, I have been practicing quite a bit. I'm going to be doing this all brutal, and the plague's name is, of course, The Cure. Speaking of the Chaos Insurgency, now is probably a great time to explain their role in the game. The Chaos Insurgency in the SCP lore is probably the second most important faction right behind the Foundation itself. The Chaos Insurgency's goals and motives aren't always clear but their main goal seems to be to oppose the Foundation's efforts to contain SCPs, and to keep SCPs contained. The group itself is a splinter of the Foundation, being comprised of mostly former members of the SCP Foundation. They play a major role in the plot of the game. In addition to that ending at Gate A where they capture D9341, it's implied that the Chaos Insurgency is what caused the breach, there are a few members working for the Foundation that are actually working as double agents for the Insurgency, and they're the ones who orchestrated the containment breach. Although this rabbit hole gets pretty deep, so we're going to get into specifics a bit more down the iceberg. Throughout its history, SCP Containment Breach has had quite an active modding scene. Now, there are some mods that are serious enhancements to the game, such as the Nine-Tailed Fox mod, SCP Containment Breach Ultimate Edition, which adds tons of new SCPs and features, and even a mod that turns SCP Containment Breach into Half-Life 1, which is really, really cool, honestly. But there are other mods that are just downright goofy. <laughs> some of the more famous ones being SCP WTF Mess Up Breach, the My Little Pony mod, and the MLG mod. Yeah, that, that really dates that mod. <laughs> to be honest, most of them are just reskins with textures and sounds replaced. 
usually with ridiculous and goofy meme noises that didn't really age well. But in recent times, with stuff like Ultimate Edition, mods have become a way to keep the game alive and fresh, which is really cool, especially since the game is no longer being developed. Anyone who knows about SCP knows about this one, the hard-to-destroy reptile that hates humanity. It's one of the coolest SCPs around, and one of the most iconic. And for that reason, a lot of people wish that it were in SCP Containment Reach. Except it is. Okay, yeah, it only appears once in the entire game, at Gate B. And it's actually the reason that the nuke goes off at Gate B. Because the Foundation doesn't want one of the biggest threats to humanity, SCP-682, being loose. So the only way they can contain it, or have any chance against it, is by nuking the entire facility. So basically, it's the entire reason that the Gate B ending happens. Of course, in addition to this, he also has a containment chamber in the game, and SCP-079 even reacts if you enter his chamber, which is a nice nod to the friendship between 079 and 682, two misanthropic anomalies trapped inside the Foundation. To be honest, SCP-682 was probably just too big to include in actual gameplay, even though it would have been really cool to be chased by him. Radical Larry is a nickname often given to SCP-106. You can find a document in the entrance zone from Dr. Gears that reads, Please refer to all SCP-level items by their case designate review numbers. While common reference names are more convenient, it is both misleading and unprofessional. Case in point, any continued reference to Radical Larry in SCP-106 reports will be met with disciplinary review from sector supervisors. While the history of the nickname is unclear, the first time it was mentioned on the internet appears to be this image, which is a old, very ableist meme that was shared on 4chan a lot. And since, you know, SCP came from 4chan, this meme probably was an inspiration. The description for Radical Larry is, This guy is all business all the time, vibrates through walls, can burrow underground. Which, as messed up as this meme is, that description does fit SCP-106 very well. While this may have been a uh, pretty obscure thing in the game, it became a common thing, probably due to Markiplier's playthroughs, where he read this note and basically from that point called SCP-106, Radical Larry. No, this is important, I wanna see this, Radical Larry! Fuck oh, you! Yeah. <laughs> well, that sucked. Oh, good, Radical Larry, you took me away just as I was seeing a very important part of the story when something new and interesting was happening. You're such an a-hole! God! Does everyone hate Radical Larry as much as I do? Because... Yeah, you hear me talking about you, you little bitch! Yeah, you better run away! You better not mess with the likes of me because I'm a super tough guy with 10 billion metric tons of muscle! Since Markiplier is one of the most popular YouTubers to cover SCP Containment Breach, the nickname seems to have stuck. Kevin McLeod is probably one of the most listened to musicians of all time, but most don't even know his name. He makes royalty-free music, and I guarantee you've heard his music before. Do any of these sound familiar? Now, you might be wondering, what does this guy and his music have to do with SCP Containment Breach? Well, most of the music used in the game was made by him. 
from the intro sequence theme to the iconic high-pitched ambience to 106's chase theme to the theme that plays at the exits and even SCP-173's jump scare sounds, which are taken from a song of his. Simply put, SCP Containment Breach just wouldn't sound the same without Kevin MacLeod, especially the ambience. I mean, that's one of the most iconic things from the game, the high-pitched droning ambience, and it really contributes to the creepy atmosphere. I mean, it's like this song was made for SCP Containment Breach. It fits so well. SCP-294 is a drink dispensing machine with a keyboard on it. Type any liquid you want and you'll get it. Of course, the in-game machine has its limits, but there's a super large list of things you can order. Now, you could be boring and get water, coffee, milk, coke, beer, and some have like some side effects. Like I think coffee will make your stamina drain slightly lower, so that can be kind of useful. But let's be honest, we're here for the interesting drinks. Like, if you request blood, you'll start bleeding, because in the SCP-294 lore, it takes the liquids from the nearest source. What I don't understand is that the blood apparently tastes like red wine. You can get an aloe vera drink to be healed slightly, but getting a cup of life will heal you completely. And there are a lot of ones that just insta-kill you, some more interesting than others, and there's way too many to go over here, so let me just share a few of my favorite ones. If you type something that... If you type something that will destroy SCP-682, it explodes. If you get the perfect drink, it will be so good that you die. A cup of Joe tastes like human remains, probably some poor guy named Joe. If you order a cup of 294, it will say, on the side of the empty cup, there are complex blueprints. They contain an untranslatable language and indecipherable diagrams. And of course, if you order a cup of Half-Life 3, you get a cup of nothing. Except disappointment, as always. The radio is a very interesting item, with quite a few secrets. Most players probably just pick it up, put batteries in it, scroll through the channels for a bit, and listen to channel 3. You might even assume that channel 3 is the only interesting one if you don't listen closely. But I promise you, every channel has a purpose. Let's start with channel 1, which is actually meant for playing custom songs. The radio plays from a folder called User Tracks, which is empty by default, but you could put some music into it. Channel 2 just broadcasts the announcement of the containment breach over and over again. Channel 3, of course, plays this iconic banger. It's a really nice moment of reprieve in the otherwise horrifying experience that is the rest of the game, which is why I think it's so memorable. But did you know that along with the music, there's also a series of messages, most of which give advice or reassurance. Channel 4 is the Mobile Task Force Radio. Man, I wish we still had some of that 420J. It was so awesome. I still keep a plan somewhere, man. Hey, man, what if we gave some 420J to that freaky statue thing? Why, he's like already stoned. And Channel 5 is a more general Foundation radio, where you can hear various messages throughout the course of the game. You can hear a guy getting captured by 106 when you first tune in, and then later on you could obtain the code to Dr. Harp's office, and a few other offhand encounters can be heard in the station. 
If you put the radio into SCP-914 on very fine, the only thing you'll hear is a series of beeps. However, this can actually be used to find the code to Dr. Maynard's office. Okay, let's get into what actually happened in the story. Dr. Maynard, on the face of it, might just seem like a normal researcher. But if you look a little deeper, you can find that it's heavily implied that he's working with the Chaos Insurgency and helped orchestrate the entire breach. There's a series of notes and clues throughout the game that detail how the containment breach happened. What we know is that the first thing that happened is that 106 breached containment. There's this document detailing the breach of 106 that happens right before the game begins. If you read between the lines, you can figure out that Agent Skinner, likely another insurgency operative, let out 106 and then slipped away. In Dr. Maynard's office, you can find a monitor that just says, it's out, and then proceeding. The it's out being from Skinner and the proceeding from Maynard, telling him that the plan is going forward. From there, Maynard goes and gives 079 control over the whole facility. We can find a monitor in 079's chamber showing a conversation between 079 and what we can assume to be Maynard. He explains that 079 has been given control over all the facility systems, and when 079 asks who he is and why he's doing this, Maynard responds, My identity is irrelevant. You're free now. Free to give the ones who imprisoned you what they deserve. Then, of course, SCP-079 lets all the SCPs out, and all hell breaks loose. And in case all that storytelling was too subtle for you, there's also a document in Maynard's office that just says, You made it so easy. Nice work, Foundation. Which is pretty obvious. It's also implied that Dr. Maynard was killed by 106, considering the black corroded spots in his office, and the fact that you can find the burnt note that gives you the code to his office in the pocket dimension. It's even possible that the scientist that falls from the ceiling in the light containment zone is him. But that's just a theory. That could be any scientist, really. If you've ever beaten the game before, you've probably seen this achievement pop up. Anti-meme. Recontained SCP-055. 055 is basically an anti-memetic object, and if you're confused, that's kind of the point. It basically just means that information about it cannot be spread. It's been observed many times, and it can be comprehended and understood, but you can't go and tell someone about it. It prevents people from spreading information. It's anti-memetic. Any real attempts to relay information about what it actually is won't work. You'll forget what you're talking about, and the other person will lose interest. It's like a black hole of information. You can observe it, but you can't relay the information. So essentially, this bit of flavor text is meant to be in uh, intentionally confusing. And you probably shouldn't try to dig deeper into what it actually means, because you won't be able to understand it. Earlier, I discussed memory access violations, which is a pretty common occurrence, but that's only the surface of the bugginess of this game. In fact, you could probably make an entire iceberg of glitches just in this game alone. I mean, especially those early versions were really glitchy. Some of them were barely playable because of how glitchy they were. From falling through the floor upon loading, that was, that was a really common one, to stuff like black walls where they shouldn't be, elevators that don't work, uh, falling through the floor upon being transported to the pocket dimension, NPCs not knowing where to go, especially Nine-Tailed Fox, and tons and tons of map generation issues where either certain areas just aren't accessible because they're intersecting with other areas or even rooms just not loading properly. Okay, but even the modern version is kind of glitchy. Like, this, this game that I played for the background footage was literally unbeatable because every time I walked up to 079's chamber, I got teleported to 106's chamber. I'm not even sure what causes this, 
but it's pretty telling that even in the modern version you can have certain seeds that are just unbeatable. To be fair, this game was made mostly by one guy on a very old engine. You can understand why there would be some bugs. But as I said earlier, some of those early versions were nearly unplayable because of how racked with glitches they were, especially the falling through the floor upon loading. That was a super common one. There are a couple of SCP items in this game that are so obscure that very few people have probably used them. And they are SCP-427 and SCP-148. I've lumped them together like this because you need to use 914 to either obtain or get any use out of them. To obtain 427, you need to put a pill of SCP-500, which is the cure-all pill, into 914 on fine. You'll get SCP-427, an ornate locket that, when opened, will slowly heal your injuries and cure you of SCP-008's effects. However, keep it open for too long and you'll die. Specifically, you'll turn into an instance of SCP-427-1, a fleshy mass. On the other side of the coin is SCP-148, which can be found at the back of SCP-035's chamber, which you can only get into if you let him out. And you have to be quick or you'll be slapped to death by his meat tentacles, which I've never really understood, but that's not what we're here to talk about. 148 protects people from mimetic effects, so 035's chamber is surrounded by panels of this material to protect users from the mental pull of putting on 035. There's a part in his chamber where the wall has been broken open and you can get a panel of 148. If you put this in 914 on course, you'll get an ingot of 148. Combine this with a gas mask or hazmat suit and you'll get the heavy versions of these items. Which, uh, hold on, let me, let me check my notes here. Uh, they protect you from 012. And that's it. Yeah, the reason I grouped these two SCPs together is because there's absolutely no reason to go out of your way to get either of them. You both have to get as far enough into the game as the heavy containment zone, where going back to 914 is quite a trek for an item that you can get a better version of earlier. In the case of 427, there's some med kits and SCP-500 itself, which will do the exact same as 427, but without the, the side effects of potentially becoming 427-1. And with 148, SCP-714 will do the exact same thing, except it has more uses and you can find it way more easily. You can actually pick up the severed hand in 012's chamber without 714, or a heavy gas mask for that matter. Because of all these reasons, these two are the most obscure SCP items in the game, and again, there's really no reason to go out of your way to get them. Yeah, this one is pretty simple. If you play SCP Containment Breach on Halloween, SCP-173 will look like a jack-o'-lantern. Spooky, isn't it? N not really. Uh, there's also a console command you can use to activate this effect, and I bet you can guess what the console command is. I'll give you a hint. It starts with H and ends with N, and it's one word. It's only this low on the list because probably not a lot of people have seen this, considering you can only see it legitimately one time per year, with one exception. Ah, the infinite hallway. If you've played SCP Containment Reach before, I'm sure you've seen this. It's in the light containment zone, and it's really easy to find. But did you know that every time you go through it, you're technically entering a parallel universe? As you walk through the rooms of this SCP over and over again, strange things will begin to happen. You might see a dead body on the ground, and eventually, the dead body will start floating. You can also encounter a guard just standing there. Items in your inventory may go missing or get replaced, 
especially with this mysterious note. And you'll hear this broadcast. And the reason I mentioned this right after the Halloween one is that 173 can have his normal texture replaced with the Halloween variant. Even though SCP-970 itself is pretty well known, everything surrounding what happens inside of it is not super well known. Like what this dead body is, what this guard is, what this note is. Well, this note actually seems to relate to this specific tale, but how it connects, I'm not exactly sure. When you die in the game, you'll usually see a message on the game over screen, a description of your death by whoever found your body. And there are quite a lot of these, as there are many ways to die, and there are different circumstances in which you can die that will affect your death message. If you get killed by 096, it will mention a giant pool of blood, and say that you were redacted by him, which probably means you were eaten by him. If you get killed by 173 in this specific room, it will say, If I'm not mistaken, one of the main purposes of these rooms was to stop SCP-173 from moving further in the event of a containment breach. So whose brilliant idea was it to put a goddamned man-sized ventilation duct in there? SCP-294 easily has the most death messages. If you'll remember, the perfect drink will kill you, and in the death message for that, it will mention self-inflicted wounds. If you get a cup of something that will destroy SCP-682, it will say the entire facility was vaporized, except for a 5 meter radius surrounding 294. Seems it wants to protect itself. Which, come to think of it, since the player character is inside that 5 meter radius, shouldn't the player survive? If you get killed by 035's tentacle things, it will say, We will need more than the regular cleaning team to take care of this. Two large and highly active tentacle-like appendages seem to have formed inside the chamber. Their level of aggression is unlike anything we've seen before. It looks like they may have beaten some unfortunate Class D to death at some point during the breach. Now, we could go over these death messages all day, but we don't have the time for that. The death messages are just some really neat flavor text that add additional context to any given death you can experience in the game. Have you ever seen this man while loading up your game? This is SCP-990 a prophetic figure that only appears in dreams of Foundation personnel. In game, he says this. You look afraid. Don't be afraid. This is a dream. The last dream you may ever have. For nightmares are coming. And the on-screen tip will glitch out giving a line from a list of mysterious lines that appear in a glitchy text. In my experience, the it will happen on current day one appears the most, although it's probably random. And while a lot of people have experienced this, I bet a lot of people probably don't know that this is SCP-990. He's one of the more interesting and enigmatic SCPs in the series. I recommend reading his actual SCP article for more information. Have you ever thought about how unintuitive the layout of the facility is, and how hostile it is to traverse? I mean, you got long hallways, confusing corridors, these T-shaped lock rooms, these red lock rooms with smoke, deadly Tesla gates, a single zone with all the deadliest threats lumped in close together, except for 173, which is for some reason in the light containment zone, all arranged in a maze-like and counterintuitive manner. When you really think about the implications of this, it seems like the site would have actually been horrible to work at, 
and even more horrible to traverse during a containment breach. Now, obviously, a lot of this has gameplay explanations, such as the map being randomly generated, and 173 needing to be near the player at the beginning of the game. But there's actually an in-game explanation for why the site layout is so confusing. We can find a modular site project document, and we can see that it was proposed by Dr. Maynard himself, who, if you remember, is actually working for the Chaos Insurgency. It seems like it was a proposal not only to change the layout of the site, but also the security systems as well. And it seems like the proposal went through, and the site that we play in is the modular design proposed by Dr. Maynard. It seems that he wanted to make an intentionally confusing site layout and a security system that was easy to compromise so that the breach would be easier to orchestrate and more chaos would be sown. In some monitors scattered throughout the site, we can even find complaints about this new design. One reads, With this new modular site design and all the improvements we made, there's no reason to worry. Yeah, an underground maze with dozens of SCPs cramped next to each other is pretty much the safest thing I can imagine. Not to mention all these barely functional prototype stage security systems they've installed. Another one reads, Nice friggin' sight. I got lost four times just trying to find the main security hub. What the hell is with this place? I tried to warn you. It was a modular design theory command cooked up. Set sections installed as needed and where needed. It was supposed to make expansion slash recovery a lot easier, but it didn't really catch on. You'll get lost a couple times, but you figure it out. It's interesting that the fact that the layout of the facility is so confusing is actually given a reason in the story. If you open the pause menu while being chased by 106 or 173, the menu will close and it will say, Stop hiding, while playing a spooky noise. Some interesting history about this feature is that in earlier versions, it would happen a minute after opening the pause menu anywhere in the game. Mm. 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 Please stop! I paused the game! I paused the freaking game! I didn't unpause the game, it just said stop hiding and it and unpaused it for me. Are you freaking kidding me? But, people complained about this essentially making the pause menu useless. So the developer of the game changed it to the version we have today. Now of course it's just a good meta scare moment, and there's no need to analyze it deeper. There's no way that this is actually an SCP messing with you, right? Yeah, it's, it's just a feature of the game. But, some features of the game might be linked to SCPs. You know what, let's just get into this. If you recontain SCP-106 and then go to Gate A, you'll get an ending where you get recaptured by the Foundation, but this time not as a Class D, instead as an SCP. You see, your ability to traverse the facility with dozens of deadly SCPs and Nine-Tailed Fox all trying to kill you is quite remarkable. So remarkable, in fact, that D9341 is proposed to be an SCP. Subject, Subject demonstrates extraordinary luck and complete mastery of even the most fatal of circumstances and an uncanny ability to predict even the most unpredictable of hazards as if it has performed these impossible tasks several times before. Further testing is required to determine whether the subject should receive SCP classification. The part where he talks about performing impossible tasks several times before is notable, as it implies that the ability to save, load, and replay the game are not just things that the player can do, but it's an ability that D9341 has. It's always interesting to me when games give an in-game explanation as to how the main character can save and load the game at will, and addressing it like this in this ending is actually really smart.
Box of Horrors was an expansion mod to SCP Containment Breach that added several new SCPs as well as new features. What's special about this mod is that some of the things that were added by this mod ended up being implemented into the actual game itself in the update 1.1. Two SCPs that were added and then later removed were 178 and 1074, but 1123, the skull, was added and it's still in the game to this day. In fact, it's the only SCP from Box of Horrors that's still in the game. However, there are some features from the mod that are still in the game today, such as the clipboard, the achievement system, having randomized maintenance tunnels, and the medical bay. The SCPs from Box of Horrors that didn't make it into the actual game include SCP-005, a skeleton key that could open every door, probably to OP, 009, which was a red substance that slowly kills you, Hmm, where have I heard that one before? <laughs> SCP-020, which actually didn't do anything, it was just a prototype. SCP-038, a tree that can clone items if you touch it, which was actually pretty interesting. And SCP-409, a crystal that slowly turns you into a crystal if you touch it. And that was kind of interesting, but gameplay-wise, it's still the exact same as 008. Yeah. I can see why some of those SCPs didn't make it, although it was cool to see more SCPs in the game. There are many console commands in SCP Containment Breach, but not all of them are built equally. In addition to the Halloween one we went over earlier, there's quite a few silly ones. Typing spawn pumpkin or pumpkin outputs the message, what pumpkin? Typing Sanic makes you go very fast. Typing Suicide instantly kills you and gives the death message. Subject D9341 found dead in Sector Redacted. The subject appears to have scribbled the letters KYS in his own blood beside him. No other signs of physical trauma or struggle can be observed. Body was sent for autopsy. Typing Weed. SCP-420-J or 420 will spawn 20 instances of SCP-420-J around you. And finally, there's Jorge, which outputs the message, Jorge has been expecting you. And if you're wondering who Jorge is, so am I. I looked all around the internet and I couldn't find any explanation other than possibly some inside joke between the developers. Dr. Gears could actually refer to three different things, depending on what the context is. For one, he's a real-life person and a writer of some of the most popular SCP articles, most notably 914, 682, and 106. He's also a character in the overall SCP universe, and also a character within SCP Containment Breach itself. In-game, you can find his office, but there's no way to enter it legitimately, and even if you noclip inside, you can see that there's nothing there. The note about Radical Larry is signed by Dr. Gears, and a portrait of Dr. Gears can be found in the entrance zone along with some other brilliant figures. In an interview with the real-life Dr. Gears, he talks about his inclusion and involvement with the game. My inclusion was entirely by design, at least for my part. Early on, when it was just barely playable, I reached out to the main dev, and some of the other people making content, and introduced myself. I wasn't in a position to provide any actual coding or programming support, but I could lend my experience and provide stuff like flavor text and the like. I had a hand in deciding the behavior of 106 in-game, offered a lot of suggestions, and even some made it in. The notes from the doctor slowly being driven mad as he's hunted by 106 are all mine, along with the picture note, which I thought was too amusing to let pass by. It was a lot of fun, and I'm a bit sad I sort of drifted away from the project. Now there's the new Unity version, which is just show-stopping, but I still have a soft spot for the older version. I was, and am, just floored by Containment Breach, old and new. I've never actually played either, as I am a huge scaredy cat, and while I love horror, I don't know if my heart and temper could take it. Well, admittedly, I have played very little of it and decided to leave it to the pros. Or maybe I just need the right opportunity, who knows. It's just all so 
staggering that something I helped make has gone on to spawn its own existence. It's like getting pictures of grandkids in the mail from a child you never really expected much from. I hope to see Containment Breach grow, and more spin-offs and games. I love seeing how people can run with the concept. There are few forms of media that you can't get in a foundation flavor these days, and it just feels so awe-inspiring. There's always that little worry, though, whenever something spreads, it changes, and not always for the better. I worry that what I feel is the heart of the whole concept will get diluted with exposure, like a photo fading in the sun. However, if it comes between seeing the foundation stagnate and die, or dealing with the odd mutation, I'd rather see it grow. Most SCPs in the game have containment chambers that can be located, but not all of them do namely 939-096 and 066, don't seem to have containment chambers. There are a few possible lore explanations, like maybe we don't see the entire facility in the game and there's more to it, and that's where those other containment chambers are. It's also possible, especially with 939, that the instances are being transported from one facility to another, which is why they're found in that storage area. But the real reason, gameplay-wise, is that it just wouldn't serve much purpose, since you wouldn't encounter them at their containment chambers, it would just be an empty containment cell. Still, it would be cool to see the containment chambers for the SCPs. In my opinion, one of the most interesting parts of the SCP Foundation is how they actually contain the SCPs themselves. It would have been especially cool to see 096's containment chamber, considering how much lore there is surrounding that. And that's actually something you can do in the Ultimate Edition mod. So, the Tesla Gate is an important way to deal with certain threats in the game, namely 106 and Nine-Tailed Fox. Of course, with Nine-Tailed Fox, you'll only slow them down since they can call control to disable the Tesla Gate. But that's actually it for the list of threats that interact with the Tesla Gate. Everything else just completely ignores it which doesn't really make sense. Let's take 049 as an example. He can walk right through the Tesla gate without triggering it. Now, is this because 049 has some sort of special power that allows him to temporarily disable it? No. I mean, maybe you could say that 079 temporarily disables it, but you can still hear the electricity going, so that's not true either. And if that were the case, why wouldn't he disable it for 106? Yeah, it's just an oversight. And with 049, it's a little bit understandable because 049 used to only exist in his own containment chamber. But after the creator of the game wanted there to be more threats, he allowed 049 to walk throughout the whole facility. But he didn't likely think about the consequences of 049 existing on the same level as Tesla Gates. And so 049 can just walk right through. This is especially disappointing because the one purpose of the Tesla Gate is to stop SCPs, or at least slow them down in the event of a containment breach. And it doesn't even do that for any of them except for one. This entry references a popular fan theory, especially back in the day. It stems from the fact that 106 would pretty much always spawn if you walked up to 895. And also, the original image of 106 appears in the flashing images that come up when you look at the monitor in 895's chamber. Which is kind of odd. This led people to theorize that 895 was somehow related to 106. Perhaps it was his coffin, or someone that he knew. I mean, why is he trying to stop you from examining the coffin in person? I'm not so sure that this theory was intentional by the game's creator, but since the SCP universe has no official canon, you're free to theorize that 895 is related to 106 in some way. I certainly think it's an interesting theory, and maybe there could be more to the story there. But again, when it comes to the actual game, I don't think there's much there. I think the monitor just needed some spooky images, and 106 is a pretty spooky image, and 106 spawning at 895 is just a random event, one of dozens in the game.
If you've ever gone into this specific containment room, you've probably noticed this badge on the ground. It's very unique, there's nothing else in the game that looks like it. It's an ID for an Emily Sharon Ross, an assistant researcher, and it has a lot of detail to it. We get her full name, an ID number, a picture of her, and a QR code, which we'll get into in a little bit. In the same room, we can find a monitor where Assistant Ross says she got trapped inside the room when the breach started. This door requires level 3, but of course she only has level 2 clearance. Another thing that seems to relate to this character is a sound effect in-game called Emily Scream, a sound that only plays when you get near this room. which seems to indicate that she gets taken by 106, which is also evident by the black spots on the ground near her ID. If you scan the QR code on her ID, you get the following text. Emily Sharon Ross, Assistant Researcher, Level 2 Code, and then a pair of coordinates, which, if you look those up, it leads to a place in Scotland. If we go into Street View, we can see this. A place called Emily Ross Furnishings. I have so many questions. Why is there a very specific ID in that facility, and there's no other ID like it, that has a QR code that contains coordinates to a store with the exact same name attached to it? Why is there a scream dedicated to her specifically? Who's this woman on the ID? I mean, there's so many things about this that are just unprecedented. The most simple explanation that I can think of is that Emily Ross Furnishings is an inspiration for this character's name, and that other than that, they have no correlation. The main developer of this game is Finnish, but it's not out of the question that he or one of the other people who worked on this game may have visited this shop and thought to name a character after it. The place actually has very good reviews. Everyone saying that the owner is super helpful. By the way, the owner is not called Emily Ross. Anyway, that's the best explanation I can think of. I don't think there's a bunch of lore to her story or anything like that. Just because I can't even imagine what the lore would be. Perhaps this warrants a deeper dive in a video of its own. But we'll see about that. This one is fairly self-explanatory if you know how 035 works, but it's a pretty interesting question. SCP-035 is the mask itself, meaning that whoever is wearing it must be someone working for the Foundation. Now, the creator of the game probably didn't intend it to be any named character, but it's fun to theorize, so let's theorize. By the looks of the outfit he wears, it appears to be a scientist. Another interesting thing is how much he knows about the facility. He knows the code to the control room in his chamber, and he knows there's an instance of SCP-500 in there. Alright, look. If you still don't think I'm trustworthy enough, there's a locked storage room behind you. You probably noticed that it's guarded with a four-digit passcode. Inside is some useful equipment, as well as a pill of SCP-500. The passcode is 5731. Got it? Five, seven, three, one. He knows, or at least he says he has reason to believe, that 079 is in control of the facility. I have reason to believe that SCP-079 has taken control of the facility's systems, including the door system. Your best bet is to appeal to it somehow. Hopefully you can come to a compromise. He knows that Gate A is the best way to get out of the facility. The easiest way to get out safely is probably Gate A. The security is pretty high, but if you manage to sneak past the guards and reach the lower level under the bridge, there's an unguarded service tunnel. That's your way out. Now, I'm actually not too familiar with O35's lore, and whether or not he gets the knowledge of the person who wears him or not. But if he does, then that all leads to one explanation. That the person who wears O35 is one of the Foundation members that was actually working for the Insurgency. 
And this leads me to my ultimate game theory. What if this is actually Dr. Maynard? Now, that might seem far-fetched. After all, I mentioned that he very likely got taken by 106. But, it's not impossible to escape the pocket dimension. And Dr. Maynard, being one of the main researchers, would know SCP-106, and he would probably be among the people that have the highest chance of escaping. Now, the second part of this theory is, why would he put 035 on? Well, if he actually works for the Chaos Insurgency, it's his way of allowing more SCPs to escape. This would also explain why he points you towards Gate A, because that's where you get captured by the Chaos Insurgency. But hey, that's just a theory. A bad theory. Don't take that seriously. Like I said earlier, there was probably absolutely no intent on the host body for 035 being an actual named character. So, take that entire theory with a massive, massive grain of salt. Many people are familiar with SCP-513, the cowbell that, if you hear it ring, dooms you to the fate of being stalked by a shadowy figure. Although admittedly, it doesn't actually do that much in gameplay, being relegated to a spooky PNG that appears in rooms sometimes. It is a very scary SCP in concept though. But did you know that SCP-513 was actually in the original release of the game, and then was removed in the 2.1 update, just to be re-added way later in the 0.8 update? In fact, the original 513 was actually quite different. You see, the cowbell itself was not even an item in the game. Instead, the sound of the cowbell would eventually be played over the PA system. After this would happen, you would see 513-1 occasionally, just like the current version. But this was removed because the fact that it happens automatically would essentially doom D9341 to die. You see, in the lore, everyone who hears the cowbell eventually commits suicide, as they can no longer withstand the torment of 513-1. So, if the character heard the cowbell, it would mean that even if he escaped, he would still be doomed to die. And, and honestly, I think that this was a change for the better, because it really just doesn't make much sense story-wise. I mean, why would anyone play that sound over the PA system? I mean, even if it was some sort of Chaos Insurgency member trying to sabotage any survivors, they would still hear it themselves, knowing they would be subjecting themselves to the torment. So again, it just doesn't make much sense, and the new version is much better, with it being an optional experience. The bloop is an infamous ultra-low frequency sound captured deep in the ocean, the origins of which are unknown. For many years, it was theorized that the sound came from an undiscovered aquatic creature, one that would have to be very large to create such a powerful sound. I'll play it for you now. I bet you've heard part of that before. That's because a part of that sound was converted into ambient noise for SCP Containment Breach. And the sound effects in Containment Breach would go on to be used in many SCP games and even some non-SCP games. So this sound got used a lot. Nowadays, the more popular explanation for the bloop is glacial activity, rather than a massive sea creature. But whatever the origin may be, 
It's a damn creepy sound, and it fits in perfectly with the ambience of SCP Containment Breach. Earlier, we talked about how SCP-513 was originally scrapped and then re-added later, but there are a few SCPs that were added and then removed and then were never added back, and there are even a couple that were considered but were never even added in the first place. The two that were removed were both from the Box of Horrors mod. The first one was SCP-178, a pair of retro 3D glasses that made you see monsters when you wore them. If you approach one of the monsters, it will chase you, and if you get to the point of being chased, not even taking off the glasses will save you. I'm not sure why this was removed, it was a pretty cool SCP. The other Box of Horrors mod that was removed was 1074, a seemingly innocuous painting, but when you approach it, you see yourself in it, kneeling. Your character would become stuck here as it comments on the art, contemplating its meaning, which would hint at D9341's backstory, and eventually you pass out. This effect could be avoided by wearing night vision goggles or SCP-714, and this was replaced by SCP-1162, which was better at telling D9341's backstory. And then there were the two that were never even added to the game in the first place. The first one being SCP-650, which many of you will recognize from the Unity Edition. It is a black statue that stands in menacing poses and only moves when you look away from it which means it would have been very easy to implement. Just take 173's programming, attach it to a different model, and remove the ability to kill. This was proposed by a member of the Undertow forums, and the creator of the game even approved of it. However, this just never ended up happening. And the last one is similar in that it would use similar mechanics to 173, except even more powerful. SCP-689 is a statue that, if you look at it, you cannot stop watching it, or you will die. Which wouldn't include blinking, you would have to turn your head away. And the statue would appear over your dead body. Development of this one actually got pretty far, with a model and a containment chamber being left over in some of the earlier versions of the game. Ultimately though, it was just too powerful. With absolutely no way to combat it other than just not looking at it in the first place. Many people know of SCP 1048, the Builder Bear. It appears in several different ways in this game dancing around, taunting the player, handing the player strange drawings, each one depicting an event in the game and even events from SCP-087-B and, more interestingly, the Pocket Dimension. How SCP-1048 knows of what's inside the Pocket Dimension is an interesting question. Of course, the real answer is that it's just meant to be an easter egg, and it's not meant to be read into too much. In fact, you can even find the original thread on the Undertow Games Forum where the creator of the game asked people to make childlike drawings of D9341 encountering SCPs, and you can see what didn't make the cut, which is honestly kind of funny. However, it's still interesting to analyze what got chosen. This has always been one of the more interesting SCPs to me, because it's difficult to figure out its intentions. The SCP document featured in the games is it exhibits extreme violence towards humans, and uses its cute appearance to lull people into a false sense of security. However, the bear itself is never really a threat in the game. Sure, 1048A is a threat, but SCP-1048 itself seems to take a certain fascination in D9341, as evidenced by the drawing. They imply that 1048 has been following D9341 and his adventures, and despite the childlike drawings, it shows quite an intelligence, seemingly understanding how each SCP works. And again, the drawings of Inside the Pocket Dimension are puzzling story-wise. Has it been to the Pocket Dimension? Or maybe it has some form of omniscience. Perhaps it has the ability to read D9341's memories. If we want to make a theory about how these drawings are possible, 
I'm not exactly sure which conclusion makes the most sense, and what the meaning of these are. What message is 1048 trying to convey? We may never know. The game has four endings. There's two at gate B and two at gate A. In both endings in gate B, you die. In one you get blown up by a nuke, and in the other you get shot. At gate A, you either get captured by the Chaos Insurgency, or get captured by the Foundation. I always found it odd that there's no real way to escape out gate B. I mean, in both endings you just die. But what if I told you that there was a third planned ending for gate B, in which you would also die? This scrapped ending would have the player dying from 173 before exiting the tunnel at gate B. Sir, there's a Class D outside the elevator to gate B. Should we send someone in to get him? He might have some useful information about what's going on in there. I'll call. Never mind, sir. It looks like 173 already took care of him. I imagine this was scrapped because of how underwhelming it would be. To get all the way to the end and then just to die by 173, who you've been running from the entire game, and that's the ending? And, you know, it's also the third ending where you die at gate B. As if there weren't already enough of those. And as cool as it would be for there to be another ending, I'm kind of glad this got scrapped. On the Undertow forums, Regalis has a thread where you can download every version of the game that was available to the public from 0.1 to 0.7.2. However, there are versions of the game that were even earlier than 0.1, likely ones that nobody but the creator and perhaps the few playtesters have ever played. In the first glimpse of gameplay that Regalis posted to his channel, we can find a very, very early version of the game. Almost everything here appears to be a placeholder, and as far as I know, there was never any demo or anything like that released to the public. So this is all we have in terms of anything before 0.1, and according to the wiki, the creator of the game says he doesn't even have access to these versions anymore, making it extremely unlikely that we'll ever play these pre-release versions of the game, which is pretty sad. It would be really interesting to be able to play these versions, because they look so different from what we have today, and it's really cool to see how far this game has come. D9341's backstory, and it all centers around SCP-1162. You see, SCP-1162 is a hole in the wall, and if you reach inside, you'll pull out items that are familiar to you. One of the things that you can pull out is this ID that belongs to a Benjamin Oliver Walker, a former senior researcher for the Foundation and D9341 remarks that it seems familiar. This would explain how D9341 knows how to get around the facility, and also how the keycard system works. We could also find this document about a disciplinary hearing about a senior researcher, and the offense being unauthorized research of a hypothetical anomalous phenomenon hereby referred to as the spiral gestalt. This note implies that Benjamin was researching something he wasn't supposed to, and as a result was demoted to Class D, becoming D9341. Now the big question is, what the hell is a spiral gestalt? And unfortunately, there's not much of a concrete answer. 
As far as I can tell, this idea is unique to Containment Breach and isn't taken from anything in the rest of the SCP world. And as such, we can only go off the information in the game to figure out what it is. And there really isn't much there, to be honest. You know those flashes of text on the main menu that appear very briefly? Well, some of them can give us a bit of information about this phenomenon. One reads, the spiral is growing. Another reads, some kind of gestalt effect due to massive reality damage. So it seems like the spiral gestalt is some sort of reality bending phenomenon. The prevailing theory is that the spiral gestalt is a phenomenon so powerful that it gave D9341 the ability to manipulate timelines, and that manifests in-game as the save and load feature. However, it seems like this research was very outside the books, which the Foundation didn't appreciate, so they demoted him to D-Class, where he would certainly meet his death as punishment for doing unauthorized research. However, everything went wrong at the site. At the perfect time for D9341 to use his powerful ability to manipulate timelines, allowing him to escape the facility. And that is essentially the story of D9341, aka Benjamin Oliver Walker. Dr. L is the last interesting doctor that we haven't talked about. I say last interesting because there's Dr. Harp, but frankly, there's not that much going on with Dr. Harp. What is interesting is Dr. L's story, or at least what we can glean from it. It all starts right before the game starts, when SCP-106 breaches containment. This seems to have a certain effect on Dr. L, according to a scientist in the intro sequence. It shook up Dr. L pretty badly. He hasn't left his office. Says he's been hearing things. We can find a monitor in Dr. L's room which reads, They just settled 106 into containment. Holy hell, the mobile containment module was unlike anything I've ever seen. I've never seen security so jumpy either. Apparently, during the last transfer, it got loose and took three guards. They still haven't been recovered. I had to sign off on the final SCP compliance sheet, and I was more than happy to get the hell out of there, along with everyone else. It's eerie walking near the service areas and hearing that deep, base hum of the electromagnets and knowing what they're holding up. I felt observed when I went near that cell. Unsettling. The next we hear from Dr. L is a series of notes that he leaves after the main breach occurs, each of which is more unhinged than the last. The first note reads, I don't know why I'm bothering. I'm the only one alive anymore, I think. Or maybe just sane? Or am I even that much at this point? I feel like I have to leave something, some shard of myself behind. I've seen the others, I know I'll most likely not even leave a body. So maybe that's what this is, slivering myself off. Leaving breadcrumbs of my brain, scattered and tattered. I keep hearing things in the dark. It's almost worse than what's in the light. I taste metal. Dr. L. Then the second note. Aversion to light my foot. He doesn't mind light. He's never had any issue with light. Never. Ever. Never. He just doesn't like to take all at once. No, not all. Not at all. It... There were tests done. During a breach, some girly item could see things. She watched it. Saw it. Was seen. Saw? He likes to hunt. Or maybe he just likes? He doesn't retreat from the light. He just stops being it for a while. He slides back and hides and counts to ten again. Begin again. And off he goes. No one ever is it again. He takes his toys and the players and goes home. Dr. L. The third note can be found right outside SCP-513's containment chamber, where the wall has been broken open. God in heaven, hell, I think the wall cracked. Or the floor? Ceiling? I haven't been up top in 12 years. I don't know which edge is top. When the locks drop, the security wall's released. Each subsection is sealed now. We're all cut off. 106 is supposed to be secured in this section, but the item overload buggered the usual assignments. I can't imagine what the primary storage sections are like. I saw a concrete wall bulge, I mean bulge like a bedsheet with a naughty child underneath, then just go back down. My teeth are feeling odd. 
This is the fourth note, and the first one to have the burnt appearance. Stupid machine with a stupid idea of a stupid world. Buggering clockwork moron doesn't play fair. I gave it a nice card and asked nice. I got a better one in return. Off I skip until the old man comes and takes my toys away. And off I run. I give it again, and the sweet talk and pet. And I get some sort of plastic stick. It glows. The doors don't know it. The computers don't like it. And now I can't open the security boot. I need to get another. Try again, maybe, but he's there, sitting, standing, stalking. I can't go back. I hear scraping. Where did my batteries go? The fifth note. Recalled to the pain as a dinner bell. Or just a shiny thing? I can't get to the section with the recall set up, so I'm the brightest, most ringing bit here. Just a little snap, a little cut, and the old man comes a-running. We never know what or why, but on he comes. The floodlights are supposed to subdue, the shapes and liquids confuse, but I think he's just lazy, like a lion. Roar, takes what he can, but isn't about to work for it. There's always another day, another way, another dead. I can hear him washing me, through the floors, watching like a fish tank. Blub blub. And then the final note, which is barely legible. I can hear him. Can you? Listen, I swear he's there, on the inner side of the wall, listening. I can hear his teeth. They sing like a power line pitched to make your bones squeak. I wish he would just kill me. Kill them. No, the report lies. Lies to the bone. He doesn't kill anyone. Not really. They die later. Die of wounds, or additions, or attentions. But no, he pulls them into his box and hurts them, then makes them maze. He cradled someone in barbed wire, touching them while they tried to scream through a shredded tongue. He owns the rules there. He's God there, the all and one. What if it's here, too? making all this just to torture it. Make a ant barb just to have targets for the magnifying glass. My molar fell out. It was black. I don't have it anymore. Will you, won't you, won't you, will. He is slow because he has time. Endless time. The group unconscious. The fear of the lean, cruel, and powerful. Is he it or the son of that feeling? You may outrun him. Run around. Run, run. Run, 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 run. And it means no. He just keeps going. Coming. Watching. Smiling. I hate this place. My home is gone. And I hate this. And I hate. And finally, there's Dr. L's office itself, which looks like the pocket dimension, sounds like 106 breathing, and is extremely messy. Uh, so, what are we supposed to make of all this? Well, it's very clear that this is meant to relate to 106, but exactly how is unclear. Dr. L also makes references to other SCPs in his notes, such as 914, 513, 079. But it seems like 106 was the main focus. 106 seemed especially interested in Dr. L, and tormenting him slowly instead of just directly confronting him like the rest. We know that slowly tormenting people is something that the old man loves to do. I don't know, this whole story is just very strange, and gives 106 these strange abilities that aren't showcased anywhere else. The ability to make a man go mad, or the ability to turn an entire room into a mini pocket dimension? This isn't just any ordinary interaction. It implies Dr. L has some sort of special connection with 106. But this brings us to the titular question. What is Dr. L's final fate? The most obvious answer would be that he is taken by 106 and killed, or perhaps tormented to his own suicide. However, there's a somewhat popular fan theory that Dr. L... is 106. This mostly stems from the fact that we don't know what the L stands for. A popular theory says that the L stands for Larry, or Lawrence, as in Corporal Lawrence, a.k.a. Radical Larry. Perhaps Dr. L was a surrogate name for 106, or somehow became 106, slowly morphing into him. Dr. L and 106 becoming one and the same. These notes are showing the transformation of Dr. L's mind into 106's mind. Especially the lines that talk about how others are wrong in their conceptions of 106, and gaining an understanding about how 106 thinks and works. If you'll recall, Dr. L's story was actually written by Dr. Gears, the guy who wrote the original SCP-106 article. This theory is very out there, 
but there's honestly not many better explanations for what happened to Dr. L and why he's so connected with the 106. So even though this theory doesn't actually make that much sense, it's the most popular theory. You know how when you beat the game, there's an achievement that pops up saying anti-meme, recontained SCP-055? Well, not many people know what that actually means. SCP-055 is one of the more popular Series 1 SCPs because of how confusing it is and... Wait, what? What do you mean we already did this one? Wait, SCP-055? What does that one even mean? Hold on. Uh -huh. SCP-055, anti-meme. Like a self-keeping secret. Huh. Information about SCP-055's physical appearance as well as its nature, behavior, and origins is self-classifying. Yeah, I'm not really sure what that means. Sorry, guys. Earlier, I discussed the radio and all the fun things you can hear by listening to the various radio stations. But there is one thing I neglected to mention, because it's the most mysterious and unknown thing about the radio. And it involves everyone's favorite radio station. The one that plays happy music with an occasional reminder from the radio announcer. Most of these messages seem like they're meant to be lighthearted references. However, there is this one. Should you hear a different voice announcing for SCP Foundation on site radio, disregard it entirely. He is not a Foundation employee. He is trying to trick you and cannot be trusted. Any advice he gives can only inevitably lead to destruction, death, and utter chaos. You are immeasurably better off. And then later on, this happens. It's extremely unclear what this voice is, where it comes from, and what its intentions are. And honestly, I really have no clue. I looked around for theories on what this could be, and the only thing I could find is that it could potentially be 035, as it says similar things to 035. However, this is unlikely due to two reasons. One, these messages seem to be pre-recorded. And two, the announcer is aware of the possible broadcast interruptions, so it seems like this is a problem that started before the breach occurred. So, honestly, I'm baffled as to any idea of what the cause of this could be. And in all likelihood, it's just meant to be a creepy easter egg. But the fact that we don't know who says this, where they're coming from, what their intentions are, is what puts it this low on the iceberg. I, I literally have no idea who or what this could be. The Pocket Dimension. To me, it's the most compelling part about 106. And what's contained inside the Pocket Dimension is very interesting, to say the least. It's unclear whether 106 has full control over what appears inside his Pocket Dimension, or rather if his Pocket Dimension is a reflection of his twisted mind, like a dream. Let's go over this room first the throne room. 
you can see two white dots looking down upon you from the throne, always watching you. You also take significantly more corrosion damage in this room. You'll see the word kneel, and if you kneel, you'll be transported to the trenches. I mentioned one of 106's alternate names earlier, Corporal Lawrence, which comes from the tale entitled The Young Man. I'm not going to go over the whole tale here, but what you should know is that it's an origin story for 106 that involves him being a soldier in the trenches of World War I named Corporal Lawrence, estranged from the others due to his strange behavior and transformed into the old man by an unknown phenomenon deep in the pits of war. This tale was no doubt the inspiration for the trenches. The giant bird in the sky which forces you to look at it represents the planes of war going overhead. This entire section is likely a representation of the horrors of World War I, and a reflection of Corporal Lawrence's experiences and his twisted mind. This room has always confused me, but apparently it's supposed to be a coffin room or a prison room. On the ground is the message, my name is not 106. Interesting. And then there's this, the fake-out hallway. It's well known that 106 loves slowly tormenting his victims, so seeing the false sense of security of his victims be wiped away when they realize they're still in the pocket dimension is probably a great pleasure to him. One way you can tell that you haven't escaped if you end up in this room is if it's your first time in the pocket dimension and you don't get the achievement for escaping the pocket dimension. That's how you know it's the fake-out. And honestly, the rest of the rooms in the pocket dimension can just be summed up with the explanation that 106 enjoys watching people suffer. Personally, I'm a big fan of the giant pendulum room. Still, I think it's quite interesting to think of where the pocket dimension comes from. The origin story for 106 varies. But what stays the same is that 106 was originally a human, but was corrupted by some sort of darker force, turning him into the old man. This dark force that turned into 106 is what the real anomaly is. 106 is just a very dangerous byproduct of it. That idea is super interesting to me, and it's what makes 106 one of the most compelling SCPs to me. Just a fair warning, this is going to get kind of gruesome. I'm not going to show any graphic images, but there will be descriptions of gruesome events. When you look at the monitor in SCP-895's chamber, there are a series of six images that flash in rapid succession before you collapse and die. Some of them are pretty familiar, such as the one of 106, this one of 513-1, and the Cheshire Smile from SCP-087-B. And then there's this thing that appears to be an eye of some sort. And then there's this bloody hand picture. This one is kinda gross, but that's not the one this entry is about. No, the final one is the one we're gonna be looking into. It's an actual image of a skinned dog, and it's very much real. According to the internet, at least. The story goes like this. Two Ukrainian women either do this to their pet dog or capture a stray dog and torture, maim, and eventually skin the dog and then take a picture of it. And that's what this picture is. The version used in Containment Breach is a little edited. The colors are a little brighter, and there's a vignette which surrounds the whole image, which hides a little bit of the body, but you can still very much see the whole skinned dog head thing. I don't want to get too preachy here, but as a fan of horror, I, th I feel like real-life gore has absolutely no place in fictional horror. Like, not everyone who's into horror wants to see real-life gore. In fact, I'd say... Most people who are into horror probably don't want to see real-life gore. Even if it's animal gore, and even if it only appears for a few seconds. 
Luckily for people who aren't fans of looking at skinned dogs, but still want to experience SCP-895, there is a mod on the Steam Workshop page that gets rid of the actual gore itself and replaces it with cute pictures of dogs. Here we are at the final entry. The darkest and most mysterious part of the game. You've heard of Gate A, you've heard of Gate B, but I bet you didn't know about Gate C. Not many people do. It's probably the most obscure easter egg in the entire game, requiring a very convoluted process to unlock it. In order to unlock Gate C, a few things need to happen first. Make sure you don't let out 035, you have the remote door controls set to off, you recontain SCP-106, and have NTF recontain 173. And also, the control needs to disable every Tesla gate in the entire game. So, you need to have Ninetailed Fox go through the entire facility. Once all these conditions are met, the facility will go out of lockdown mode. Now, you'll need a keycard Omni, and you'll need to find this specific end room in the heavy containment zone. You'll hear a message from 079 saying he can open up this door if you re-enable the door controls. Human, I can open gate C for you, but only if you re-enable the remote door control system. This will only work if he didn't already unlock gate B. So go back, re-enable the door controls, and then this door will open. Inside you'll find a keycard door that can only be unlocked with the keycard Omni. Take the elevator up, and when you get out, you'll find Gate C, where you can find SCP-682 fighting with Goku in the ultimate standoff. Okay, fine. I admit it. There is no Gate C. It's false. No way. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. It never happened. This one was invented by a writer. No, there's no Gate C. But lots of people have theorized about what Gate C would be if it actually existed. Personally, I think the endings are fine as is, and there's really no need for a Gate C. I think people just want there to be a Gate C because, well... A, B, C. Yeah. <laughs>